Uh, but I think there's a, we, we, the atheist community is somewhat culpable for this we, cause, because we're criticizing faith and ir irrational belief in gods. What I've run into in talking about Islam specifically among atheists is a sense that we have to be, we ha we're somehow logically committed to being equally opposed to all religions, irrespective of their effects. So to sort of single out Islam from the point of view of atheism is somehow uh, to be co-opted by these, these uh, by bigotry, by an, al an alliance with, with Christians. Uh, uh, but I mean, there's, there's nothing that, there's nothing that demands that we not notice the different consequences between different faiths. I mean, any, anyone who is uh, just as worried about the Amish or about Anglicans as they are about Islam, is just reading the wrong section of the newspaper. <laughs> uh, I, I simply didn't think of myself as an atheist. Uh, I didn't use the word, I mean, I, in the same way that I don't think of myself as a non-astrologer. You know, I don't, no one has to wake up in the morning and repudiate <clears throat> astrologer, uh, astrology by accepting the identity as a non-astrologer. Uh, and there's no one who, who you know, n virtually no one believes in Zeus, and we haven't defined ourselves in opposition to paganism. We're not non-pagans. Um, and I think it's also useful to point out that every devout Christian stands in the same relationship to Hinduism or to, to Islam as I do. I mean, the Christians look at what's going on in, in Muslim discourse. They look at the claim that the Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe, and they are not persuaded. And that's all, that's all my atheism consists of. I'm, I'm not persuaded by the, these patently ridiculous claims, and I am persuaded by the evidence that these people are part of a, a culture that is designed to uh, not look critically at its own discourse. Uh, and so Christians can see that of Islam. They can point out the errors of thinking there. They just don't point it out in Christianity. Um, so the, from my point of view, I, I don't think this is where I may differ from some of my colleagues. I, I don't think the word atheism ultimately is, is necessary or even useful, and I think it's actually, uh, in the end, harmful. Uh, because it, it uh, re the rejection of absurdity is much bigger than atheism. I mean, it, it is science. You know, it, reason is much bigger than atheism. And uh, having standards of evidence and argument is much bigger than atheism. And, and that's all we need to repudiate most of what, peop what most people do most of the time in the name of, of religion. We define physics as, you know, loosely speaking, our best effort to understand the behavior of matter and energy in the universe. Uh, so it's defined with respect to the goal of understanding how matter is going to behave. Now, anyone else is free to define physics in some other way. I mean, the, the, you know, a creationist physicist could come into the room and say, well, you know, that's not my definition of physics. I want my physics, I want, I want to simply match the book of Genesis. Uh, and we are free to exclude that person and say, well, you, know, you really don't belong at this conference. That's not physics as, as we are interested in it. Um, you're using the word differently. You're not playing our language game. That, that gesture of exclusion in no sense, the, the fact that the discourse of physics is not sufficient to silence that guy that that, 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 that that person can't be brought into the conversation doesn't nullify physics as a domain of, of right and wrong answers. Uh, and yet, on the subject of morality, we seem to think that the possibility of differing opinions, the fact, the fact that someone can come forward and say, well, no, my morality has nothing to do with human flourishing. It has to do with following you know, Sharia law. The fact that that position can be articulated I hear people like Jonathan and certainly many philosophers saying, well, that proves in some sense that there's no there there. This is all made up. This is not, we can't, uh, the fact that you can articulate a different position is a, is a problem for the whole field. And I think it's not. So I think, I think we have, um, obviously we have an intuitive physics and much of our intuitive physics is wrong with respect to, to the goal of understanding how matter and energy are going to behave in the universe. I'm, what I I'm, want to say is that mo most people, most of us, most cultures have an intuitive morality. And much of our intuitive morality may be wrong with respect to the goal of maximizing human flourishing. The question is, do you ever have to believe anything on insufficient evidence 
to explore this terrain, to become truly... Uh, what is sufficient evidence? Well, it's, it's the kind of evidence everyone in this room demands on any subject other than religion. I mean, there, there are nuances here. We can, we, it, it takes a lot of work to, to rise to the standard of scientific evidence, but um, science is the one language game we are playing where we get really straight and rigorous about what constitutes evidence, where there's a process of peer review, uh, where you have a lot of smart people trying to prove you wrong, and where you actually win points by proving yourself wrong. And this is not what religions are up to. Religions are not uh, falsifiable in this way. Um, the divine origin of certain books figures rather centrally to Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Yes. Uh, this contail, entails a variety of claims which are on their face at odds with science. Um, the belief that, that Jesus was born of a virgin may be a, a, a cherished claim for most Christians. It is also a claim about biology. I mean, this is why you can't keep religion and science apart. They are, they, 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 their truth claims cannot be disentangled, which is what you want I don't to do. Wanna, I don't want to spend my night defending the virgin birth, but... Uh, um, <laughs> well, they don't that think that their body doesn't disintegrate. They assume that it does disintegrate. What they assume is that there is something inside of you that is eternal, which yeah. I assume as well. And it doesn't seem, to me resurrection. Anti, doesn't seem to me anti-scientific. Well, it's anti-scientific if you uh, believe that you have good evidence for that. I mean, this, this, is, this is what's anti-scientific. When your certainty, when your convictions don't scale with your evidence. I mean, I'm actually open-minded on the survival of death. I, I right, don't you know. You say about reincarnation, that there could even be evidence for it in your book. Yes, I mean, I, I can easily tell you what would constitute evidence. I'm not saying this evidence exists, but... Um, I, mean, I can tell you what would constitute evidence for the truth of Mormonism. It's, it's, it's just not forthcoming. Uh, there, there are all kinds of scientific things you can say about religion, which religious people tend not to want to hear. I mean, you can say, for instance, that Mormonism is objectively less likely to be true than Christianity. Now, why can you say this? Because Mormonism is just Christianity plus some rather stupid ideas. <laughs> but it remains a fact that yogis and mystics uh, are said to be walking on water and raising the dead and flying without the aid of technology, uh, materializing objects, reading minds, foretelling the future, R right now. In fact, all of these powers have been ascribed to Satya Sai Baba, the, the South Indian guru, by an uncountable number of eyewitnesses. Now, he even claims to have been born of a virgin, which is not all that uncommon a claim in, his, in the history of religion. Or in history generally, Genghis Khan supposedly was born of a virgin, as was, was Alexander. Apparently, parthenogenesis doesn't guarantee that you're going to turn the other cheek. Uh, but Satya Sai Baba is not a fringe figure. He's not the David Koresh of Hinduism. His followers threw a birthday party for him recently, and a million people showed up. So there, there are vast numbers of people who believe he is a living god. You can even watch his miracles on YouTube. Prepare to be underwhelmed. Uh, I mean, it's true that he has an afro of sufficient diameter as to suggest a total detachment from the opinions of his fellow human beings, but I'm not sure this is reason enough to worship him. Uh, in any case, so consider, as though for the first time, the foundational claim of Christianity. The claim is this, that miracle stories of a sort that today surround a person like Satya Sai Baba become especially compelling when you set them in the pre-scientific religious context of the first century Roman Empire, decades after their supposed occurrence. We have Satya Sai Baba's miracle stories attested to by thousands upon thousands of living eyewitnesses, and they don't even merit an hour on the Discovery Channel. But you place a few miracle stories in some ancient books, and half the people on this earth think it a legitimate project to organize their lives around them. Does anyone else see a problem with that? Now, as someone who has spent the last few years criticizing religious faith, I've become quite familiar with how people of faith rise to the defense of God. As it turns out, there are not a hundred ways of doing this. There appear to be just three. Either you argue that a specific religion is true, 
or you argue that religion is useful, or you attack atheism as intolerant, elitist, or uh, otherwise corrosive of basic human values. Now, the, the only line of argument that is relevant to this debate, or indeed any debate about the validity of religion, is an argument that religion is true, or rather that one religion is true, because they, of course they can't all be true. In fact, our opponents here stand for two distinct and mutually incompatible faiths. Was Jesus Christ the Messiah? The rabbi and Dinesh are not likely to agree on that point. As Bertrand Russell pointed out over 100 years ago, even if we knew one of the Earth's religions was true, perfectly true, given the multiplicity of faiths, given their mutual incompatibility, all, all believers should expect damnation purely as a matter of probability. But before I go deeper into this issue of religion's truth, I just want to illustrate how confused a person must be to argue that, that it is reasonable to believe in God because religion is useful, because it gives life meaning, because it makes people more moral than they otherwise would be, as the rabbi suggested, uh, because it makes people happy, any of the benefits you could imagine of religion. Hey, imagine you're walking down the street and you, you run into an old friend, and he looks radiantly happy. You ask him what, what's going on in his life, and he tells you that, that everything changed for him the day he realized that he was destined to marry Angelina Jolie. And it, it might occur to you to ask, why, why, why does he believe this? I mean, Angelina Jolie is, after all, one of the most beautiful and famous people on the planet. She's not, incidentally, met, married to Brad Pitt. They have something like 27 children at this point. Okay, what, what, what if your friend, sensing your skepticism, said, you clearly don't understand. This belief gives my life meaning. Okay, I, I now know my purpose in life. It's to be Angelina's husband. What if your friend said that this belief has made me a better person? I'm now incredibly kind to children, anticipating having to raise Angelina's once Brad leaves. Or what if your friend said to you, you can believe whatever you want, but I wouldn't want to live in a universe where I don't marry Angelina Jolie. Okay, it, it's, it should be quite clear at this point that your friend has lost his mind. Okay, and it's probably a dangerous person, and yet this is precisely the kind of talk that so often passes for wisdom in religious circles and may attempt to pass for wisdom here. Certainly the, mora the morality argument is of that sort. Beliefs are not like clothing. Okay. Comfort and utility and attractiveness cannot be our conscious criteria for adopting them. To believe a proposition, you have to believe that you have good reasons for believing it. And, and the effect that this belief will have on your life cannot be among those reasons. And this is what it is to be clouded by bias. This is why we have phrases like wishful thinking and, and self-deception. To really believe that there is a God is also to believe that you stand in some relation to his existence such that if he didn't exist, you wouldn't believe in him. How does the supposed usefulness of religion fit into this scheme? It doesn't. I, th I think we should think about this, this what this co concept of the afterlife does. Um, but just to give some context, we, we're living in a world in which nine million children every year die before they reach the age of five. Okay, year after year after year. I mean, that is, that is a, uh, an Asian-style tsunami of the sort you remember from 2004 every 10 days, killing only children before the age of five. I mean, think about these children, think about their parents, know that virtually all of these parents are people who believe in God and were praying all the while that their children would be safe, and their prayers were not answered. Now the afterlife is, comes into the midst of this reality uh, and as a promise that all of this is going to make sense in the end, that somehow at the end of existence we are going to be all let in on the, the punchline and have a, a, a mighty laugh with Almighty God for eternity. Now, there's no evidence of that, and I think, therefore, this concept of the afterlife 
really functions as a, as a substitute for wisdom. It, it functions as a substitute for, for really absorbing our predicament, which is that everyone is going to die. There are circumstances that are just catastrophically unfair. Evil sometimes wins and injustice sometimes wins. Uh, and the only justice we're going to find in the world is the, is the justice we make. And I think we, need, we have an ethical responsibility to, to absorb this really down to the soles of our feet. And, and this notion of an afterlife, that the happy talk about how it's all going to work out and it's all part of God's plan is, is a way of shirking that responsibility. Or consider the treatment of women. I mean, for millennia, the great theologians and, and prophets of our religions have set to work on the, the riddle of womanhood. And the result in various times and places has been widow burning and honor killing and genital mutilation, a cultic obsession with virginity, uh, just other forms of, of physical and psychological abuse so kaleidoscopic in variety as to scarcely admit of being summarized. Now, I, I have no doubt that much of this sexist evil predates religion and can be ascribed to our biology, but there's no question that religion promulgates and renders sacrosanct attitudes toward women that would be unseemly in a brachiating ape. Now, while man was made in the image of God, woman was made in the image of man according to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Her, her humanity, therefore, is derivative. It's erzatz. The Old Testament values the life of a woman at one-half to two-thirds that of a man. The Quran says that the testimony of two women is required to offset the testimony of one man. And every woman is, is deserving of one-half her brother's share of inheritance. But the biblical God has made it perfectly clear that women are expected to live in, in absolute subjugation to their fathers until the moment they are pressed into connubial service to their husbands. And the New Testament offers no relief. I mean, St. Paul put it in his letter to the Ephesians, wives be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their husbands in all things. The, the Quran delivers the same message. And on most translations, argue, says that, that uh, disobedient wives should be whipped or scourged or beaten. The 11th century sage, Al-Ghazali, perhaps the most influential Muslim since Muhammad, described a woman's duties this way. She should stay at home and get on with her spinning. She should not go out often. She must not be well informed, nor must she be communicative with her neighbors and only visit them when absolutely necessary. She should take care of her husband and respect him in his presence and in his absence and seek to satisfy him in everything. She must not leave the house without his permission and if given his permission, she must leave surreptitiously. She should put on old clothes and take the deserted streets and alleys, avoid markets, make sure that a stranger does not hear her voice or recognize her. She must not speak to a friend of her husband's even in need. Her sole worry should be her virtue her home as well as her prayers and her fast. If a friend of her husband calls when the latter is absent, she must not open the door nor reply to him in order to safeguard her and her husband's honor. She should accept what her husband gives her as sufficient sexual needs at any moment. She should be clean and ready to satisfy her husband's sexual needs at any moment. Now recall the blissful lives of women in Afghanistan under the Taliban or think about the, the millions of women who even now are forced to wear the veil under Islam or who are, who, who are forced into these, these forced marriages with men they have never met. And you will realize that th these kinds of religious opinions have consequences. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. I was at a conference a few years ago talking about the link between morality and human well-being, as I'm going to tonight. And I said something that I thought would be quite uncontroversial in this context. I said, Listen, we know that morality relates to human well-being. We know that human well-being relates to the, 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 the facts that allow mind to emerge in the brain, and, and uh, so it's constrained by, by truth claims in some sense. And therefore, we know that 
certain cultures are wrong about how to maximize human well-being, and therefore they are, uh, they're wrong in terms of what they value. And I cited as an example uh, life, under the, life for women, especially, under the Taliban. Uh, it seemed to me you know, their violent misogyny and religious lunacy was, was a pretty obvious context in which people, especially women, were not thriving. <clears throat> Now, it turns out to denigrate the Taliban at a scientific conference is to court controversy. Uh, <clears throat> and so after I spoke, a, 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 another speaker came up to me and said, well, how could you ever say that the compulsory veiling of women is wrong from the point of view of science? And I said, well, okay, the moment you link questions of right and wrong to questions of human well-being, then it seems pretty clear that forcing half the population to live in cloth bags and beating them or killing them when they try to get out is not a way of maximizing well-being and therefore not a good practice. And she said, well, that's just your opinion. <clears throat> I said, okay, well, let's just make it easier. Let's imagine we found a culture that was removing the eyeballs of every third child. Okay, would you then agree that we had found a culture that was not perfectly maximizing human well-being? <clears throat> And she said, it would depend on why they were doing it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So that after I picked my jaw back up off the floor, I said, <clears throat> okay, let's say they're doing it for religious reasons. Let's say they have a scripture which says every third should walk in darkness or some such nonsense. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> and you'll be pleased or horrified to know that she just bit the bullet here and said, then you could never say that they were wrong. Okay, now this is... Uh, This was a woman who has a background in science and philosophy. She's now on the President's Council for Bioethics. She's one of 13 people advising our President on all of the issues related to progress in medicine and life science generally. Um, she had just delivered a totally lucid lecture on the moral implications as she saw them for, for the use of neuroscience in our courts. She was, she was very worried that we have been developing lie detection technology and that we are using this on captured terrorists. And she, she viewed this as an invasion of cognitive liberty. Okay, so on the one hand, her, her, her moral scruples were really finely calibrated to our own possible missteps, in, in this case in our war on terror. Uh, but she was rather sanguine about the, the ritual enucleation of children. Uh, and it seemed to me terrifyingly detached from the very real suffering of millions of women in Afghanistan at this moment. So this kind of impossible juxtaposition of views uh, is something I'm encountering a lot now uh, among disproportionately well-educated uh, and liberal people. So it's, it's, um, it's something we have to grapple with. Now the issue for most people is that <clears throat> it has been said over and over again that there's a distinction between facts and values and that science and rationality generally can only really make truth claims about the former. So science obviously can deal with facts. We have a universe of facts that we can understand to a greater or lesser degree. Facts transcend culture in some basic sense. But it's thought that values are another thing entirely. Values are, are the domain of questions of right and wrong and good and evil and Inconveniently for us, this is the area where the most important questions in human life arise. These are questions like, you know, how, how should you raise your children? What goals should you strive for in life? What, what constitutes a good life? And it's thought that science will never be able to tell us the right answers to these questions. It's just as science is never going to tell you whether you should like chocolate over vanilla, it's not going to tell you how you should raise your children or treat your neighbor. Now, I think this is an illusion. I think this is quite confused. And it's a, it's a dangerous illusion, for as I said, it erodes the conviction of very smart people in the face of really <laughs> barbaric practices um, which occasion needless human misery.
that point of, of not knowing what happens after death is what worries me about this conversation. I was, I've been very worried about this, that all of you have given up a perfectly serviceable Tuesday evening <laughs> only to hear the four of us tell you every which way that we have no idea what happens after death. <laughs> And uh, well, I expressed the spirit of my wife, and she was actually able to put me these. Uh, I'm worried, obviously, about boring all of you. And uh, she said, nothing Hitchens does is ever boring. <laughs> the, the God of the Bible hates sodomy and will kill you for it, but he rather enjoys the occasional human sacrifice. <laughs> but I think at the very least, we can, we can say he doesn't quite have his priorities straight. In the Old Testament, we witness the most immoral behavior imaginable. Genocide, ethnic cleansing, sexual slavery, the murder of children, kidnapping, all of it not only permitted by God, but mandated by God. I mean, if you doubt this, take another look at books like Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and 2 Samuel and Numbers and first and second kings, and Zechariah. I mean, these books, on these bo in these books, the, the most unethical behavior is celebrated. If, 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 if these events occurred in our own time, half the prophets and kings of Israel would be shackled and brought to the Hague for crimes against humanity, including Moses for slaughtering the Midianites, including Joshua for slaughtering the Amalekites, including Elijah for slaughtering the, pro the prophets of Baal. I mean, these men, by, by our standards today, they were utter psychopaths. I mean, it's also worth observing that the most atheistic societies on the planet, like Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands, are in many respects the most moral. I mean, they have rates of violent crime that, that are far lower than our own in the US. Uh, and they're more generous, both within their own population and in the developing world on a per capita basis. And Sweden, which opposed the war in Iraq, has nevertheless admitted more Iraqi refugees uh, into its borders than any country, and many more than the US has. So if you're looking for a, a state model of Christian charity, the most atheistic societies at this moment fit it better than the most Christian societies do. But when I, you, 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 Bob mentioned the mosque controversy, I mean, what was so startling about this, I mean, clearly the mosque is legal to build, it should be legal to build, wherever you build it, you can build a church, you should be able to build a mosque. That's not the issue. The issue is that everyone who defended, who, who rose to the defense of this mosque, did so by denying what is patently obvious. So you have, you have Mayor Bloomberg standing up saying, Islam had uh, nothing to do with 9-11. Islam is a religion of peace. 9-11 was as much a product of the actual tenets of Islam as the homophobia of the Christian right is a product of a vast discussion about the abomination of homosexuality that has been going on in Christianity for centuries and is directly attributable to the writings of Paul. I mean, I, specific ideas have consequences. I mean, any, any of you who have read Lawrence Wright's book, The Looming Tower, he talks about the, the people who went to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets, to fight jihad. And they used to, when one of their comrades would die in battle, first of all, they would, they would put their encampments in completely exposed places so that they could be bombed by helicopters and thereby martyred. And when one of their comrades would die in battle, they would weep with envy. They would congratulate him and weep with envy that they weren't martyred. It seems to me that, that, that secular people and religious moderates are uniquely ill-placed to appreciate what that state of mind is like. And yet, People are attesting to this, if, you, if we will only listen, people are attesting to this, the strength of this belief system ad nauseum. And the other variables that Bob wants to invoke here, and again, specifically on Islam, 
economics and political oppression don't account for this behavior. The 19 hijackers were living in Germany. They all were college educated. Most of them had PhDs. These are engineers and architects. These people, uh, the, the Germans were monitoring their, their conversations. Their apartment was bugged for months before 9-11. All these guys talked about was paradise and the Quran and the evils of infidel culture. Read the book Perfect Soldiers. So we, we, what we have, well, the problem we have is that we desperately want to believe that everyone views the world the same way and if we could just moderate our behavior all of our enemies would disappear. It'd be, it'd be so much easier to imagine that, that we made our enemies. There's, there's no evidence for that. No credible evidence for that. And so whenever I hear someone on the left, and again, I'm on the, I am on the left on every relevant issue. I think homosexuals should be free to marry. I think taxes should go up on the wealthy. I think the war on drugs should be declared over. I, I am just as, I am left. But when I hear people on the left talk about Osama bin Laden as though he were the Reverend Jim Jones of the Muslim world, I mean that, that is a, a, a phantasmagorical degree of denial of the obvious. Osama bin Laden could be doing anything else he wants with his life. And, he, and the problem we face vis-a-vis -vis Islam is that he, the version of Islam that he's teaching is, is really faithful to the Quran and the Hadith. I mean, you have to split hairs to see what he is distorting, if anything. Now, if he were Amish, or a Jain, or even a Buddhist, it would be absolutely obvious what he's distorting. I mean, you just couldn't make sense of his behavior in terms of his faith. Everyone knows what it's like to be an atheist with respect to Zeus. We all reject Zeus out of hand. We, w we would resist mightily any encroachment into public policy that tried to constrain scientific research out of deference to the Iliad and the Odyssey or any other Zeus worship. And um, you, can, you could say no scientific study has ruled out the existence of Poseidon. Um, and yet this... This analogy, which I'm now drawing between Poseidon and the pers personal Christian God, or the Jewish God, or the Muslim God, uh, really strikes uh, the theists, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, as a total non sequitur. Um, so it, as an aside, I might say that, that I now get hate mail from people who actually believe in Poseidon which is, you know, quite a surprise. I mean, Richard and I confidently trot out this, this analogy, saying, you know, we all know that Poseidon doesn't exist. Uh, Christians or Jews or Muslims, like yourself, th think it a totally spurious analogy, and yet, you know, the, the hate mail comes pouring in to my email box from, from neo-pagans, who, who, you know, I've been called a racist for, for uh, uh, you know, denying the validity of these religious beliefs. So what you have on your side are sheer numbers of subscribers, uh, 2 billion Christians, 1.3 billion Muslims. Um, it's, uh, that personal God is compatible with, with, with an endless amount of progress in science, and yet the, the mood you feel the, about uh, Poseidon, the, 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 the reflexive rejection of Poseidon is the mood that uh, could extend to, to the, the God of Abraham and, I th and should extend. The problem with religion is that it is the only mode of thought that systematically closes people to real conversation. Because it is the only mode of thought that puts a positive value on a person's perpetual immunity to new evidence and new argument. And this closure is euphemistically called faith, and it is generally thought to be beyond criticism even by atheist scientists who don't share it. Now, I want to make it clear, I'm not advocating new laws. I'm not advocating that we infringe people's religious freedom. I'm advocating new rules of conversation. There is no law against believing that Elvis Presley is still alive. Okay, this is not, how have we kept this belief from invading our boardrooms and our academic departments? 
The principle of our immunity is, is really quite simple. Anyone who seriously espouses the idea that Elvis is still alive, either in a, in a lecture or in a, in a job interview or on a first date, immediately pays a consequence in, in ill-concealed laughter. There's a general principle at work here. People who claim to be certain of things they clearly can't be certain of have a problem meeting their goals in life, except when these certainties are on the subject of religion. But such people do not get asked to run our major corporations on any other subject, when they, when they espouse these certainties on any other subject. They, they don't get invited to present at conferences. They're apt to find their business cards dis discreetly placed in the trash. Okay, this is, it, it, notice that we don't have to pass any laws against bad ideas to, to reliably deliver these rebukes. We simply have to be free to criticize bad ideas. And we are free to criticize bad ideas, except we're not availing ourselves of this freedom on the subject of religion. It is, it is certainly possible, and I think this is true, that there is a distance between what people profess they believe and what they actually believe, and what, what, they, will, what they will say on a questionnaire, uh, and then what, what is really operative at the level of their behavior. Uh, now, what this distance is, that's, that's something that's uh, difficult to determine in any case. So when you have something like 38% uh, uh, of British Muslims now claim that, that, to claim to believe that anyone who leaves the faith, anyone who commits the crime of apostasy, should be put to death. This is 38% of British Muslims. We're not talking about Pakistan or Afghanistan. Um, that's quite an alarming finding. Now, what percentage of them would actually be willing to kill someone who, who uh, leaves the faith? I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a distance between what you think and what you're actually going to do. But the idea that somehow uh, it is a tiny minority of people who profess these things, who actually believe them, there's no evidence for that. I mean, there, there is an apparently an inexhaustible supply of suicide bombers. Uh, people like Chris uh, seem, to, seem to imagine that the cause of this is not their belief in martyrdom, it's not the, not the idea that, uh, that you're going to get everything you want after you die and, and there's nothing better than death in, in defense of Islam, which is what I argue. Uh, they seem to believe that it is poverty and economic desperation and lack of education. The reason why we know that can't be true is it, that everything we find out about the kinds of people who hijack planes and fly them into buildings or blow themselves up on, on the tubes in uh, the UK, they are disproportionately well-off, and they are disproportionately educated. Uh, this, this goes from the top, you know, from people like Osama bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed who don't blow themselves up and maybe cynically manipulating people who really believe these things, but it goes all the way down through the 19 hijackers, all of whom were college educated, many of them had PhDs, it goes to the leaders of Hamas and Hezbollah, and it goes down to the foot soldiers who blow themselves up. They are, the, your likelihood of dying if you were affiliated with Hezbollah, dying through suicide bombing, uh, goes up if you're better educated. I mean, this is, and, and support for suicide bombing goes up in conjunction with literacy. This is not a movement of the, of the poorest of the poor and the least educated. And that, and, and the idea that it, it, it would be nice if it were, I mean, then the remedy is just spread the money around and teach people about, about all we've come to know in the last 2,000 years. Uh, but, but, our situation is quite a bit more sinister than that. It is possible to be someone with the, with the technical expertise, uh, uh, who, someone who can build a nuclear bomb, uh, and to still think you're going to get 72 virgins in paradise. That's what we should be worried about, that the, these beliefs really are operative, and the idea that no one believes them while everyone professes them, I think is an act of faith uh, none of us should be willing to uh, adopt. You know, Whenever I find myself in this position criticizing religion, if I say that, for instance, uh, Muslims are uh, not justified in their belief in martyrdom, for instance, or Christians are not justified to believe that, the, uh, that Jesus was born of a virgin, resurrected, will be coming back to earth to wield his magic powers, uh, I'm often met by Christians and Muslims of a more moderate persuasion who will say that I have completely caricatured the faith, that I have 
taken extremists to be representative mm. of the faith. Um, and there are a few problems with this response. I, I take your response, Ray, as a, as, a, as a version of that, that you know, not all Christians believe that X, Y, and Z. Um, first, it discounts the fact that, that so many millions and millions of Christians and Muslims do believe these things. I mean, we are living in a country where 53% of the, the population claims to believe that the, the universe is 6,000 years old and that we have no precursors in the natural world uh, apart from Adam and Eve. I mean, that we did not evolve out of prior life forms. This is a majority of the American population. Uh, so it seems to me this is, you can call this extremism. I mean, this is these views are extreme in almost every respect. They are extremely silly. <laughs> they, are, they are extremely worthy of our denigration, but they are not a, extreme in the sense of being rare. This moderate defense of religion where, in, where you sort of, uh, you can have this vaporous, very diaphanous uh, set of truth claims that are not really true. It's hard to know the difference between uh, religious claims to knowledge and mythology. Uh, it, it represents a misrepresentation of so many millions of people who, who, whose decision making is, is really a, of consequence to us. Uh, the other problem is that it, it, it's, it's plain by a double standard that you would, you would be immediately hostile to in every other area of your lives because you, these, these beliefs are claims about the way the world is. I mean, everyone is in the business of trying to understand the situation we are in, uh, trying to get our behavior to, to, uh, move through this situation in a way that's compatible with happiness. And religion is a strategy for doing it. It, it. it just happens to be a strategy that is built to a remarkable degree upon lies and self-deception. Uh, and it, so, so I argue it's, it's the wrong tool for the job. And that's We form beliefs about facts, and this constitutes science and history and journalism and every other domain in which we, we claim to be ta talking about the way the world is. But we also form beliefs about values, and this, this captures all of the juicy questions in life, meaning and morality and, and spiritual experience. But it's always seemed to me that these, these two operations, why many, people, why many people think they're quite different, are the same. And so we did some neuroimaging work where we put people in a um, fMRI scanner and we gave them statements to read, very simple statements drawn from many different categories. Uh, but we, we were able to separate out mathematics and ethics, which were really our, our most dissimilar content areas. Mathematics was just equations being judged true or false. And ethics was very value-laden statements like, it's good to be kind to children versus it's, it's good to torture children. So a completely different content, and yet the difference between accepting a proposition as true and rejecting it as false was essentially the same. And so I, what I would argue to you is that if the brain is doing the same thing when it accepts a proposition versus when it rejects it, regardless of whether it's about Jesus being born of a virgin or about mathematics, we should, we should be hesitant to ascribe radically different categories to, that, to, to those operations in our, in our conversation with one another. We're facing a problem at this moment. The, the, there is, there is, I'm happy to say, a religion of peace in this world, but it's not Islam. Okay. To call Islam a religion of peace, as we hear ceaselessly reiterated, is completely delusional. Now, Jainism actually is a religion of peace. Jainism is a, that the core principle of Jainism is nonviolence. Gandhi got his nonviolence from the Jains. The crazier you get as a Jane, the less we have to worry about you. <laughs> it is. Jane extremists are, are actually, they are, they are paralyzed by their pacifism. Jane extremists just, they, they can't take their eyes off the ground when they walk lest they step on an ant. They filter every sip of water through cheesecloth, lest they sw swallow and there, thereby kill a bug. So the problem, uh, notice, the problem is not religious extremism. 